Hello, hello, hello. Hi, Francis. Hey, Joel. How's my sound? It's great. Doesn't need to be louder. I could go louder. It's perfect for me, but if you think you're too low. Okay, now, I'm not exactly sure how this works. I could see you, but I don't think my camera's on. Oh, you just, you went on, the, um, on the menu on your right, click the icon for a camera. A webcam. A webcam. Share my webcam. And then your green light will go on. Hey, there you are. That doesn't look very good. You're a little fuzzy. Yeah, looks pretty good. Hold one minute. Any better? Yeah, it is. I also have to clean my screen. I realized half of it's on my screen. It was just dusty. Dirty, dirty boy. Well, I don't know how that even happened. I mean, I use this thing all the time, so. Yeah, you're getting clearer and clearer. Uh, yeah, but it's still a uh, built-in camera. I mean, I could go to my other computer, but. It's good enough. The problem is I have no background. I have to solve my background problem. Uh, so is this actually a live event? It is. Okay. I see you've got people coming in. I did put out an email. I saw that. Thank you. Just thought I would see if I could help out. Yeah, we got about 50 sign-ups right after that went out. So more people for your, uh, your email list. <laughs> And, you know, that's that's one of the things people just, it takes them a long time to realize there's more to your email list than opt-ins or than freebies. Yeah, yeah. I'm so you look like you have a pretty nice webcam. I'm, now I'm jealous. It's my Mac. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm on a Mac. I'm on a MacBook Air from 2011. Yeah, my computer is about two or three years old. It's the one in my office is about six weeks old. It's brand new. I finally had to break down and get a new one. So how long is this? You said you were going to go about 40 minutes. Is that right? Well, for my questions for you, and then we'll go to the audience. When I 
when I had Joanna Penn two weeks ago, that went on for an hour because she was open to being here that long and people had lots of questions. They had questions that were just pouring in. So mm -hmm. tell me if you want to cut it short, just let me know. No. Uh, you know, 40 minutes with some Q&A following it is fine with yeah. me. I mean, I wouldn't want to go over the hour if that's okay because yeah. I got yeah. another one coming up. <laughs> you are a busy man. Oh, uh, yeah, well, I'm too busy. That's my problem. Uh, let's yes, see. Yes, three years together, Joel. I was just shocked when you told me that. And uh, I guess it's true. I don't know that somehow in myself. Let's see. Okay, that's good. That's going to be perfect. Yeah, if we could shut it down by 2, I'm in good shape. It's 1 o'clock right now, by the way. Yeah, and I know. You probably don't need me to remind you, but don't forget yeah. to hit the record button. I just didn't want to. Uh, I've done that. It says record, anyways. It's it. I, I have this. It's already recording. It. Okay. It doesn't record now. It doesn't record till I start the broadcast. Okay. Do you want me to hit mine just as a backup? Sure, that'd be great. Happy to do it. All right. Here we go. Hey everyone, this is Francis Caballo. When I started my last webinar, I forgot to say who I was. And so, <laughs> in case you don't know me, I'm Francis Caballo, and this is Conversations with Francis. And today we have the wonderful, the awesome Joel Friedlander. How do you like being introduced that way, Joel? Awesome. That's a new one. Thank you, Francis. I'm, uh, I'm flattered. Yeah. Well, I have this intro, and I'm going to read it because there's okay. no way I could have I could have memorized it. So. Joel is an award-winning book designer and blogger. He's been launching the careers of self-publishers since 1994 from his book design and consulting practice at Marin Bookworks in California. Joel also writes thebookdesigner.com, an extremely, and I added that, an extremely <laughs> popular blog on book design, book marketing, and the future of the blog. And he is the founder of the self-publishing roadmap. Now, are you going to be restarting that, Joel? Yes, I hope to offer it uh, before the end of the year. It's oh. been off the market for about two years, Francis. Yeah, I, I remember that. So it's a training course for authors. He talks about all kinds of things, including metadata. I mean, that's a, that's a great topic. It's an important topic. He's also the founder of bookdesigntemplates.com, where he provides pre-designed book templates for word and design and saves authors so much money and the founder of Author Toolkits with Marketing Tools for Authors. And I am so proud to say that I have a toolkit on there, the social media toolkit. It's 25% off right now. All the toolkits are off 25% 20, off right now. And he's and also... It's wonderful. The I best, know, right? the easiest way I know for somebody new who doesn't really get social media or how they're supposed to do it, the toolkit you put together, Francis, is the easiest leg up for people I've ever seen. I mean, it just really takes you by the hand and walks you through what you're supposed to do. I think it's awesome. We've gotten great feedback on that uh, on that whole digital tool that you put together. I'm so glad. In fact, I have a I, I have a slide at the end with the um, with the URL for it. Continuing with his introduction. <laughs> Also the founder of the Book Planner, a new tracking and scheduling tool for authors who publish their own books. Now I, I was I was lucky. I got to see a preview of this, and I have a copy of it, and I adore it. I wish I'd had it when I was publishing my first book, but I have it now, and I'm going to be referring to it for my future books. And so it's it's just fabulous. And if all that weren't enough, all this stuff about Joel. He's the past president of the Bay Area Independent Publishers Association. And as you know, Joel is a master blogger. And I say with that with so much respect in the publishing field. His blog consistently makes it onto Writer's Digest top 10 list. I want to be on that list. And the book designer is considered one of the best in the industry. So welcome, Joel Freelander, to Chats Conversations with Francis. Well, that was awesome. Francis, thank you very much. A, a really thorough. Now, there were a few things I did back in the 80s you missed, but that's all right. You, you got most well, of it. Well, we don't talk about the 80s here. I'm just kidding. 
So the way this format's going to go is I'm going to spend about 40 minutes asking Joel questions. Some of them are multiple questions, questions, and some of them I've actually divided because I was asking them too many. And then when we run out of the questions, or before we run out of the questions, if it's 40 minutes, then we're going to turn to you and you're going to get to ask Joel whatever you'd like to ask, whether it's about blogging or self-publishing or book covers or whatever. It'll be your chance to talk directly to him. So, and Joel be, will be able to see the questions as well. So, as promised, we're going to talk about blogging, of course. So, Joel, it would be great if you could describe how you started blogging <coughs> and why or how you think your blog has attracted so much attention and such great well, appeal I, among self I can members. definitely answer half of that question. <laughs> I'll do the best I can. Well, you know, uh, I was um, <clears throat> helping. Uh, I was actually out of the book industry for a, a bit because I had. Uh, I have a company called Marin Bookworks. Uh, it's been in operation for about 30 years. I use it uh, in that company. I provide book design and production services for publishers and authors. And uh, I kind of shut that down for a while to help my wife and her business for, uh, for a couple of years. And when I came back into uh, publishing, a lot of things had changed. Uh, for instance, uh, print on demand had become uh, operational. We didn't have that before. So that, that was a really big change for self publishers because you could now publish a book with little or no risk. That was never true before. <laughs> publishing used to be a very risky business, which is why it conglomeratized into big companies because they're better able to absorb risk, obviously. So uh, I came back in, I was looking around, I was reading a lot of blogs and seeing what was going on in the publishing field, and I was looking for clients, right? I'm uh, running a book design business. I need uh, people who want to get their books designed this month, otherwise I don't have any income. And uh, it seemed to me that it would be a really good idea to start writing about this. Now, I had spent two years just before I started blogging uh, writing doing free writing practice virtually every day. And free writing is simply a timed writing to a prompt. We try to write as fast as possible. You never stop writing. And uh, you try to write faster than you can think, basically. So that's really kind of great writing practice, like weightlifting for writers, you know. And uh, so I started my blog and, um, in late 2009 and uh, coming up to my uh, seventh anniversary I guess and um, I just I took a blogging course because I realized I was older than most people who were starting blogs and I just didn't have as much time as they did to get traction so that was that really was the background for why I started blogging so aggressively I wanted to get traffic I wanted to see if it would work for me and I wanted to do it quickly so I gave myself like six months. I said, well, I'll do this for six months and I'll see what happens. And if nothing happens, then I'll do something else. But it worked out really well for me. And uh, soon after I started blogging, because I, I have a very conversational, practical writing style. So I like to tell stories and then I explain things in pretty clear language. So if there was any reason why I got a lot of attention from people, it was because, first of all, nobody was writing about what I was writing about. Okay, how to construct a book. What are all the details that go into book construction? Now, you could apply this to any subject matter expert because somebody who's an expert in something knows lots of little details that people who aren't experts don't know. So that's what I was doing. I was writing about type fonts, how books are sized, why you pick certain sizes, what it takes to do a book, different ways of doing printing. You know, really foundational, what we now call, you know, foundation content, pillar content, evergreen content, whatever you want to call it. It's, uh, you know, it's like a backlist for a publisher. That, that evergreen content on your blog is really important. So what happened was people started to link to me. And obviously, Francis, links are what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So I had people right away link, like I wrote an article about copyright. It wasn't really a very clear statement of how a self-publisher should deal with copyright down to like, this is what you should put on the copyright page. Here, just copy this, exactly what I gave you. I mean, there was many good copyright resources, but nothing aimed at the like do-it-yourself. So I think that um, 
the fact that I wasn't write, I was writing about something that wasn't well covered, I was putting out a tremendous amount of content because I was publishing five original articles a week. Let that sink in. And then a list post on the weekend because you didn't want to let those days go by. And also that I had this kind of clear style that was easy to read and understand. So I think that's why I started to get traction. Now, were you writing about book design five or six days a week? <laughs> it seems impossible, doesn't it? It does. Yes. Well, I mean, look, the, um, when I describe my blog, I say it's about book design, book marketing, and the future of the book. Because those are the things that really interest me most about the book publishing business. You know, what form will books take in the future? What is the actual effect of ebooks going to be on the whole bookosphere, the whole book universe? I think that's fascinating. I'm, I'm a student of history. If you like typography, as I do, because I am a designer, and a book design is basically typographic design, it's designed with type fonts. See, I'm doing it right here, Francis. I'm explaining things in exactly the way I do on my blog. I stop when I know that you don't know what that means. I try to fill it in. So, um, uh, I forgot the question. That was about if, if your blog was primarily about book design. I mean, Oh, yeah. That, so, that I, that's what I wrote about. I wrote about design, five, six days type away. fonts. Book sizes, uh, copyright, you have to know that. You know, it's not strictly design. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how to set up a publishing company. Look, I had all this very specialized information. I've been doing this a long time. I self-published my first book in 1986. That's before most of the people listening to this or watching this were born. So I've been doing this a long time. I, I, I just have acquired, like anybody would who was doing it that long, just acquired a lot of information. And so I wanted to share that information and empower people to do it themselves. Now here's one of the things that drove me, Francis. When I started blogging, I started looking at a lot of self-published books. And some of them looked really good. I was really impressed. And many of them looked really bad. They looked, in a word, crappy. And that really offended me because it doesn't cost any more to print a book that looks good than it does to print a book that looks like crap. So why are people doing that? And I deduced that it was because they didn't know any better. Aha! Yeah. There's my opportunity. I, I'm an educator. I love to teach people so I thought well that's my job. And if you look at the tagline on my blog it says, practical advice to help build better books. That's my, that's the, um, the mission statement of the blog, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So you've talked in the past about taking a class with Yaro Starak. <laughs> yeah. Can, can you, and you know, and, and lots of people take the class with Yaro Starak, but you're one of his stars. And so what, what contributed to that, do you think? Uh, look, when I got started, um, like I say, I, I wanted to, to get going quickly. I didn't want to, you know, you can figure it out yourself eventually, but how many years is that going to take you? You know, it takes a long time. So I found that, I actually found Yarrow had a, has a, a freebie he gives away um, called the Blog Profits Blueprint. And, uh, of course, this was back in... Um, 2009, so it was. he has a whole new one now, but he still had one then. And uh, I actually got the audio version of that, Francis, and I just listened to it for like weeks, trying to figure out what is a blog? How does this work? How do you actually get people to read it? And then how do you make money from it? You know, I'm in business. My, I started my blog as, as an extension of my book design practice. So uh, I saw he had a course, but I didn't want to take the course. At the time, it was $500. I thought, that's crazy. Why would I pay this 26-year-old kid from Australia $500 to learn blogging? Are you, that's insane. I, said, I couldn't figure out any way to make it made sense. That was up until the time my wife kind of stuck a knife in my back and said, I think you should take the course. Because she, I mean, she knows I'm cheap, so I just didn't want to spend the money, and I didn't see any reason to do it. I mean, blogging, I, what's easier? You just go over there and sit down and start typing. I know how to do that. 
So I gave in. She kind of twisted my arm. I'm not kidding. And she forced me to take the course. And so I was very determined to get my money's worth out of that course. Okay, so I put down 500 bucks. That's a lot of money. So I was really determined. So I took that course dead serious. I went through every lesson. I did all of the exercises the arrow suggested at the end of lessons, and he had a lot of them. And I tried to follow that as best I could. And guess what? It worked. What can I say? I mean, I, I just I did everything. It was 26 lessons. I went through them all. It, I thought I was going to do it in a few weeks. It ended up taking me about six or seven months, as I recall, to actually finish it. And I think his course is actually better now. He's totally revamped it. And, um, you know, if, if you're serious about it, it's really better to take some kind of training. Now, maybe Arrow is good for you. There's a ton of other really good courses on blogging online. Uh, so I'm not saying Blog Mastermind is the only one. That's just the one I took. And uh, in fact, Francis, last week to kick off conversations with Francis, you had Joanna Penn on, who graduated from the same course I did about a year earlier. So it worked for her. <laughs> yeah, she has a really popular blog. Yeah, sure helped her launch her career. So I love blogging. Uh, I to me, you know, I started self-publishing in the 1980s. That's what you were I doing in the 80s. I didn't, I didn't um, start blogging until 2009. But to me, they're completely connected. They're, there's very little difference between them. So I'm going to ask that question you don't want to answer, which <laughs> is, you know, you always make it on the Writer's Digest top 10 list, which is you know, kudos to you. It's fabulous. It's awesome. It really I'm is. I'm very grateful. And so, why? Why do you think you make it? What, why do you think, what, what qualities about your blog do you think includes your blog on that top ten list? I've been asked this question before. I had a friend of mine who's been blogging longer than me and who's a wonderful blogger. I read her blog. She pulled me aside at a conference once and said, I want you to tell me seriously why you get so much more traffic than I do. I tried. I, I, don't, I don't have a, a, a clear, simple answer to that. I will say that, you know, part of the, you know, I talked about the blogging course, but there is really a lot more to it than that. For instance, this, you know, in blogging and on, online in general, you, I said earlier in this interview, links are everything. So, I mean, how many bloggers actually have a linking strategy? I mean, do you have a strategy that you thought out and tried to put in place of how you can get links back to your site? I mean, I think that's actually pretty important, but I'm quite sure that maybe one out of a thousand bloggers who are authors are actually doing that or, or thinking about it. So, I mean, you can't ignore all these. They, they may seem like small things, and certainly when I started out, the links I was trying to placing or trying to entice other people to place uh, that directed back to my blog, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of traffic coming down those links. And I, I picture them as like little streams or rivulets of water running, you know, because you can see how the rivulets kind of combine into little streams and then the streams combine into little rivers and pretty soon you got a ton of people coming down that pipe. But when you start, you don't have that. It's, it's, like, it's like pouring from the empty into the void. You're doing it, but nothing seems to be happening. So it takes patience and uh, hard work and a certain amount of thinking. So if you have a big potential audience, you're writing on a topic people really need to find out about in order to reach goals that they have set for themselves. Like I have tens of thousands of authors in my audience. They're trying to publish books. They don't care about me particularly Francis. It's not me they're interested in. And I knew that from the beginning. I used to be in direct marketing. I mean, I kind of understand this. People were coming there to solve problems that they had to reach a goal that they had set for themselves in publishing. I'm here to help them get to that goal that they set, whatever it is. So practical information, uh, you know, and you have to market your blog. Another thing that I frequently say to authors that is most commonly met with a blank stare 
Huh? What? I have to do what? I'm writing the blog. Yeah, but are you marketing the blog? If the blog, if you publish a blog and the <laughs> nobody knows, what good did that do? Right. So there are a lot of things that go into it. There is no one simple answer, and uh, probably I'm just a lucky guy. Oh, a lot of hard work, and you also <laughs> blog on a topic that everyone needs to know about. Who's up? Who wants to publish a book? Yeah, and and look. I'm constantly surprised at how much traffic my blog receives. It's a real, it's a very robust media site now. I mean, that's what it's become over the years, and you kind of have to be open to that. You might start out with one idea, but you know, your your whole experience and your readership may move you in a different direction, and that's okay. You know, uh, like for me, I mean, I was writing five articles a week, original stuff. Now I write maybe one article a week, but I'm very involved in a lot of product development. But where did that come from? It didn't come out of nowhere. The, pro the need for the product appeared because I was interacting with people on my blog all the time for years. People tell me what they're getting, where they're getting stuck. You know, that's what the comments are for. They want to rave about uh, you know, what was wrong with that article. That helps you understand where they, they're at. So virtually every product I've created in the three companies I'm operating now all grew out of my blogging. It's all from the blog. It's from the conversations on the blog, the opportunities to meet people from blogging, you know, people pitching me stuff, uh, you know, because they know I have an audience. So it all is about that uh, whatever it is you're doing to try to attract people to your site. So what I was going to say is, you know, you it's true, Francis, that there are a lot of people who need to know about books. But if you pull back a little bit, this is actually a very small niche in the grand scheme of things. If you look at topics like weight loss, relationships, living and dying, career, cars, celebrities, I mean, I could go on and on and on. There are all of these mega fields that just have you know tens of millions of people. The self publish do it yourself self publishing market is never going to be that big. It you know, uh so I it's true that there are a lot of people who want to know about books, but there are a heck of a lot more people who want to know about other stuff. That's true. I think it just seems big because we're in it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We're uh, it's the typical big fish, small pond conundrum. So I have another question for you. So That's why I'm that, here. That new authors, <laughs> that new authors get confused about blogging. Uh, for example, I was on a commuter bus traveling to San Francisco to fly somewhere, and mm -hmm. somebody sat next to me and she asked me, "You know, what do you do?" So I told her what I did, and she said, "Well, you know, I'm a new fiction author, and I've been told that I was supposed to blog, but I don't know what to blog about." So. I find that new authors get confused about blogging, probably because there's a lot of information on blogging, but a lot of it is about nonfiction, for, you know, really, really key towards nonfiction writers. And some people are now saying that fiction authors don't even need to blog. What do you think? Yeah, I think fiction authors don't necessarily need to blog. It's not, uh, I wouldn't put it as number one, two, three, four, or five probably for a new fiction author as far as their marketing uh, plan is concerned. Obviously, every author needs to have a website. You've got to have your press kit up there. You've got to have your book pages, landing pages, all that stuff. That, that, but, you know, for fiction authors, I think a blog works well after you've already gained a readership. See, over in nonfiction, we use the blog to grow the readership. Right. So it's really different, and that's because we can accurately target the market that would be interested in a nonfiction blog. Like mine is about self-publishing, so I can find people who are interested in self-publishing. That's not that hard. Um, you know, if you were a, a canoeing expert or a kayaking expert, you could find the people who are talking about kayaking who are just into kayaking, i.e., your potential readers, fairly easily. But if I just wrote a novel about growing up in suburban uh, New York in the 1960s, how, how do I find that audience? 
I can't, I can't, it's not it's not possible to identify them the same way. Okay, I know they're on Facebook. Does that help me? No, because everybody's on Facebook. So, in other words, it's really a challenge to find the market uh, for for uh, the fiction that you're writing, and that could be done. But I'm not sure that a blog is the best way to do that. Now, there are certain kinds of novelists that might take to a blog. Uh, more readily. Like if all you're going to write is historical romances located in the Edwardian period, and that's really what, that's your stuff, then you know that, and, and then you're just going to stay in that, sit in that spot. Then you could start blogging about that. You probably have a huge amount of information. You're a, a subject matter expert about Edwardian England. So that gives you the basis for a blog on that subject. Now, will readers of that fiction be atta attracted to your talking about the background to your fiction? Well, some will be. A lot of them won't be. But it does give you a basis from which to uh, you know, expand your reach online, uh, if that's the kind of thing you like. But if you write different genres, you're writing contemporary romance or vampire thrillers, you know, I mean, it. I think that it would works better for those authors after they've already published a number of books and gotten readers. You know, once you're uh, got some celebrity, even in a little tiny genre, then it's more likely people are going to be curious about you, and you know, want to hear more from you, your background, how you came to write these books, you know, what the characters mean to you. I mean, there's a huge amount of content you can get into because it's like having a conversation with your readers. But uh, it's, it's really pretty tough for uh, fiction writers to try to use a blog to grow a community. And you know, Joanna found that out herself because you know, when she started blogging, she was a nonfiction author. And so she said her whole approach to blogging was, see, I'm, I was doing it for a long time, so I came in as an expert on the subject. Her idea was, I'm going to try to figure this out. I'll show you what I've learned, which is a great way to do a blog. You know, it's very engaging for readers. Um, but what she found at the end was she grew a massive blog with a huge community, but they were all writers. So you can't really sell books. Once you started to publish fiction, it just it wasn't there was a mismatch between the people who were reading it and the yeah. people who might be potential buyers because who knows whether they read thrillers or not. I mean, there's no reason to think they would. So that's what I'm talking about. If you could really identify the market, then I think every nonfiction author should be blogging because it's the best marketing tool ever invented for a subject matter expert or a nonfiction author. That's interesting. It's not the answer I thought you were going to give. <laughs> okay. That's true. I mean, there, Live and learn. There are fiction authors who do well with a blog. I'm not sure when they started them. I'm thinking of Anne R. Allen, um, Suzanne Lakin. Although now Suzanne Lakin, she writes nonfiction also. But and Anne Allen, she's been publishing a long time, as far as I know. She may have yeah. started it with a fairly good sized readership. Yeah. Uh, look at uh, Hope Clark. She's a you know, a best-selling novelist. She does a, an email newsletter now, which is kind of like a, you know, something that a blogger might do, and she runs a site. And she's got tens of thousands of writers on her email list from doing that. But, uh, you know, she already started off as um, a widely published novelist. Now, the other thing is that she has a big list because she found a way to serve the needs of writers also from her site, and she publishes on her newsletter. It's mostly about you know uh, writers' conferences, writers' competitions, stuff like that. So she's you know dead center on the on the writers on her list and what interests them. Yeah, I'm going to move on. Good. <laughs> this is off the topic of blogging. So we finished blogging. It's huh? We finished blogging. We finish with the blogging section. We'll let, we'll let everyone sure. else ask you more questions about blogging. Keep going. Fine I with really me. wanted to know the answer to this question, so <laughs> I'm going to insert it. Ask me anything. Yeah. What do you think the biggest obstacles are for self-published authors who really want to excel with their writing careers? I mean, so many people start writing, and they have 
such aspirations as as all of I mean we all have such aspirations and then some some of the people make it and you know in different genres and some people don't and so what are the obstacles that some people just aren't able to surmount? Or what are the obstacles that people need to surmount? Would be a more positive way to frame it. Well, I mean, there are tons of obstacles, Francis. I mean, maybe your book isn't the right book. Yeah. I mean, a lot of authors who are hobbyists, in a sense, or enthusiasts, they don't think about that when they're writing the book. They're writing the book out of some inner need. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you're going to end up with a book other people want to read. <laughs> That's true. So, also, it's quite common for self-published authors to quit marketing too soon. Mm -hmm. You know, they market the book for like three weeks, and they didn't get many sales. They say, well, I guess that didn't work, and they quit. That's crazy. I mean, in most of these books, I've got a book I published, I first published it in 1986. I did another edition of it in 1992. It's still selling today. I get a check every month for sales on that book. You don't have to ever stop marketing these books. The more you market them, the more sales you're going to make. Simple. Another reason is because they have a mismatch with their market. They thought, Maybe they thought they knew, like unlike number one, where the author gave no thought to who the book was for. They just wrote it out of their own internal need. You know, in this case, the author might think they know, but they're, they've mismatched with the market. Maybe they produced a book that that market doesn't want. Maybe it's more expensive than every other book in the market. Maybe it's smaller, and all the other ones are 8 half by 11 workbooks. I mean, it's just, you can mismatch, totally. Another reason that people get disappointed is they have unrealistic expectations. You know, if you think your book is going to sell 100,000 copies and you're going to quit your day job and put your feet up and just keep writing books and everything's going to be hunky-dory, you know, maybe that book that you wrote on, uh, you know, mating habits of the male dung beetle, maybe there's just not a big audience for that. Maybe there aren't 100,000 people who want to read that book. I mean, did you check? So, you know, mostly the answer is no. I didn't. How would you do that? Joel, how, where do I check? You know, there's no magic bullet. I mean, obviously, some people get lucky. They do a good book, and somebody discovers it. You can always get discovered. I have a blogger friend who got discovered that way. Six weeks after he started his blog, he got discovered by Seth Godin, who's you know a marketing genius and the publisher, or the author of yeah. numerous best-selling books. And he saw this guy's blog. Now, he was blogging all over the place to launch his blog. He was doing guest posting as a way to drive traffic to his new blog. He did like 42 guest posts in six weeks. Wow. That's seven a week. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> anyway, Seth God saw him, and he started reading the blog, and he realized this guy's a great writer. And what did he do? He sent his agent. He connected his agent to this blogger, and... Uh, Signed the contract, took about three years. The book finally came out like a couple of years ago from a big publisher. You can get discovered, but you know, at least like in, in his case, Josh Hanegard is his name. You know, he did a lot of marketing of that blog. He let people know what he was doing. He tried to find the people who would be interested in what he was doing. And if you're curious, the name of his blog is World's Strongest Librarian. That's interesting. So, to sum up, having unrealistic expectations, not doing your homework in advance, stopping marketing too soon, and having a mismatch with your, your market are all reasons that, you know, it just doesn't work out. Right. Right. Oh, so, maybe you answered this, but in case you didn't, I'm going to give you, I'm going to ask it anyway. So, What's the best marketing advice you have for self-published authors? Well, if you're a non, yeah, this isn't blogging either. So if you're a non-fiction author, my best advice is learn how to blog. Okay, start blogging. If you're a fiction author, you know, start thinking about a bigger scale. In other words, I consult with a lot of authors. Now, if I said to an author I was consulting when I said, okay, one of the best ways you can market yourself is to um, give away a lot of books. 
giving away books is a very old strategy in book publishing. It really works well. But the problem is, most people, if I said to you, could you give away 500 books today? Most people, they, they, they could give away 20 books. And that's it. They're friends and family. So that's not going to help, is it? Because they already know about the book. So uh, to, to market, uh, you know, one thing you might need is a mailing list. That's one way to do marketing for books. It's very effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and a blog is a really great way to build a mailing list. There are other ways to do it. And uh, so that's one way. Uh, and then the, the fiction authors, they have to find creative ways to get their work in front of as many people as possible. Many fiction writers are using the free book or first book in a series uh, being free or a novella or a book that's kind of a backstory to your main series or you know you have to find a way. If you're, if you're a writer who writes a book about you know like a contemporary romance and then the next book you write is a historical thriller and the next book you write is sci-fi, you're in big trouble. <laughs> you're going to have a very tough hill to climb. Because you're just writing for all these different markets. You can't market to all of them the same way or at the same time. But finding ways to get your work in front of a lot of readers, like places like Wattpad where you can uh, put stories up and attract, hopefully, lots of readers. Um, Goodreads where you can give away books or get into discussions. Uh, some of the promotional sites, you know, the free ebook sites. BookBub, which runs huge promotions off their massive mailing list. Mm -hmm. It's just you got to keep thinking of ways of getting your work in front of people. I mean, that's really what marketing is for most fiction authors, particularly when they're starting out. Just, just getting it in front and and uh, you know, give them give them away. Do everything you can to give that work away. What you want to do is get people hooked on the story, get them interested in what you're writing, you know, get them into your voice, and uh, hopefully you've got more than one book. And I will say that's another cause for failure, Francis, from our last section. And that is publishing one book and expecting to make a business out of it. That's another cause for frustration among self-publishers. Hey, it happens, but it's, you know, it's like finding money in the street. You might find some money in the street, but you can't live on it. <laughs> that's true. Well, I, w I want to ask another question before we go to questions, and that's what do you think of the, what do you think of, of audiobooks, and how important are they in the mix? What do I think of audiobooks? I think uh, everybody um, should be thinking about audiobooks, and I have the reason right here in my hand. Yeah. It's my little iPhone. Listen. Uh, also, as many people know. Uh, the audiobook revolution is coming to your car very soon. Now, starting next year, yeah. in next year's models, a lot of cars are going to be coming with internet radio, basically podcasting, built in. So audiobooks are perfect content for mobile devices, whether it's your phone, a tablet, or your car, which is going to become another mobile device. Yeah. 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 Because audio is uniquely able to be consumed while you're doing something else. I can't read a book and make uh, cookies, but I can listen to an audio with total fascination while I'm baking cookies, which I love to do, by the way. I just made a batch of chocolate walnut cookies, double chocolate walnut. You guys are I'm not going to get into the recipes, but you know, this is, it doesn't sound very unusual until I tell you that I don't use flour when I bake. Anyway, so I would say audiobooks are on the rise. Everything I've read is that audiobook sales are up. It's a really great way to realize that you can move your content into different formats, and that's a, like a really good way to monetize the work that you've done. Because you know, if you have it in an ebook, you have one universe of readers. If you have a print book, you add another universe of readers. If you have an audiobook, you add another universe of readers. Why cut any of them off? 
So, and I think they're particularly effective, effective for fiction. So I would, I would urge fiction writers to get into audio because, you know, in fiction, it's the story that's really grabbing you. And that's perfect for audio. Um, so I, I would encourage fiction authors to do uh, maybe short stories in audio, short clips. I used to do, uh, I'm a writer also, and uh, I used to, I've done over the years numerous audio clips that are like from 5 to 20 minutes. And I don't sell them or anything. This I just do it for fun, and I distribute them to friends. And but everybody loves them, and uh, at least that's what they tell me. And uh, it's easy to do, and you know, it's a way of communicating with people where your voice is going directly into their brain, and that creates a very strong connection. Yeah. What about nonfiction books? Well, it works. Uh, yeah. I don't see any reason not to. Uh, they don't have to be story-based like I told you about 20 minutes ago, my experience of getting the audio file of the Blog Profits and Blueprint and just listening to it incessantly for weeks. Right. And it's a really good way to absorb information sometimes. You know, you can stop the, uh, you can stop the tape, at it, uh, the recording at any time. You can start it again. I, I love audio. And um, I, I've listened to audio. If you, if you think of all the different kinds of audio and you don't even have to call them audio books I mean what if you made a podcast and you just broke your book up into like 30 minute chunks you could create a podcast that was really it was just your book your audio book in 30 pieces instead of one piece I mean that would give you a stream of content if you put that out once a week that's that's most most of a year worth of content right there so I mean you know, my, my, my take on all this stuff has changed, Francis, since I've gotten into marketing stuff because uh, most writers have a huge amount of content on their hard drive that's not part of their book because we're all writing all the time. I mean, that's, that's what you do, right? So uh, finding ways to, ex you know, to really exploit all that work you've put into your content uh, is what really makes me excited. Cool. I think it's time to take questions. Do we have any questions? Do you know this? Um, yeah, I have some questions, but I'll save mine. All right, I'm going to expand this. So. That's one big cup, Joel. Gestures. What's in the question box? Can't hear. Is there a video? Yeah, that's a big cup, Jeff, because I believe in hydration. I used to be an avid mountain biker, and, uh, you know, our motto was hydrate or die. So these days I use tea as my hydration vehicle, and uh, I've always got a big cup next to me. Just think of it as like a water bottle. Yeah. <clears throat> you don't have any questions yet. There's 20 questions, 21 questions. Okay. Okay. Is it necessary to be on all podcast platforms? I don't do a podcast, so I'm a really bad person to ask about podcasting. But if it's anything at all like publishing, there's, there's no reason to limit yourself. There, look, there are people who like Stitcher, and there are people who like iTunes. Mm. So you're the publisher. You have to, you're, you're publishing for a market. The market is telling you where to put your product. You're not telling them where to buy it. They're telling you, this is where I want to buy it. So if there are people who want to buy it in one place and people who want to buy it in another place, why wouldn't you put it on both? I mean, after all, it's, you know, the, the work to do it initially isn't that much. And then you never have to do it again. You just set it up and then it's there. So, yeah, I would... Just on a general basis of you know um, marketing and selling products, I would try to have them available to everybody. So someone else asked, "This is from oh, this is from Pamela Toffer. You talk about links. So for a nonfiction author writing about business networking for introverts, what kinds of links would you target?" I love that subject. Business marketing for introverts. See, there's a pretty big audience there. I would say for that. Okay, so here's the basic idea about link building. Uh, you want to, what the, what the link is, is two things. The link is one, a vehicle for people to click 
to come to your site, actual real people who are going to become visitors. Get that out of my way. So that's number one. The other thing is the SEO value of links, and that is your search engine optimization, or how your site looks to search engines like Google. If your site, uh, now if you just think about this from their point of view, suppose they're looking for an authoritative answer on marketing for introverts. And let's say you've got 300 websites in your field linking to you using some kind of anchor text, and that's the text that's used for the link, that somehow communicates the idea that you're an expert on marketing for introverts. You are going to get a huge amount of traffic from search engines because all those, they see all those links from the back end, and they see that all of these sites consider you somebody to say, has something to say on this topic, something valuable to say, otherwise they wouldn't be linking to you, would they? So what you're looking for is the links from authority sites in your field to your uh, blog. And if you can get, you know, the, if you can get good anchor text, usually that's not under your control, but if you can get good anchor text, then I would always try to get that. And, and uh, just to be clear, anchor text is the text that we use to form the link. So sometimes people put click here, and you know, click here is the link. I would, I would advise you to never do that because that doesn't really communicate anything. And I will sometimes try to intentionally do that. Like if I want to link to Francis's site, I'm going to write, or you might take a look at Francis Caballo's site, Social Media Writer. She's a, an expert on social media for writers. And then I'm going to use expert on social media as the link text, the anchor text. So you want authority sites linking to you from within your field. Now there are many strategies to do that, but that's basically what I'm talking about. You know, some of those you could place yourself. For instance, if you do a guest article for somebody in your field that's an authority site, you're going to get the opportunity to put one, two, or three links in there. So, there you go. Okay. Um, Josie asks, hey, uh, what are good programs or ways to turn your books into audiobooks? Well, again, I'm not an audiobook expert, but I have seen a couple of courses around lately. Uh, I'm, I know two of the uh, creators of these. Daniel Hall has a course. I believe it's called Real Fast Audiobooks. All his courses are called Real Fast. And uh, he's a pretty thorough guy. He, he, uh, I know him personally, and he walks through this. Uh, the other person is Derek Docker. D-O-E-P-K-E-R, and he has a course on uh, audiobooks as well that's very thorough. And I know Derek, and he's an excellent marketer. So you might check those two people out. Unfortunately, I don't have URLs for you, but they both have what I would consider to be good quality um, audiobook courses from people who know what they're doing. I can get the URLs from you, Joel, and send them out. Um. I bet you can. You can just put them with the show notes. Yeah, show notes. Do you want to pick a question? No. You want me to? Let me see. I'm working on a couple of projects. Jeff says coffee notes. dehydrates. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not drinking coffee, Jeff. That's a diuretic. Um, yeah, I mostly fluctuate between green tea and hibiscus tea. Nobody asked me that question, but that's the question I wanted to answer, so there you go. So if I'm working on a couple of projects in different genres, shall I have separate websites, blogs? Well, it sounds like a fiction author, but I can't be sure. Look, here's the problem. You know, um, like Joanna Pitt, I mean, she was writing books about how to market stuff. That's basic nonfiction you know, business books, kind of. And then she started writing thrillers. Now, how can you market those to the same people? You can market to them to, to the same people because in every audience there's going to be some overlap. There are some people who want to know about business who also read thrillers. Probably not a very big percentage, but some percent. But you can't market to those 
authors, uh, business people, like they're thriller readers because most of them probably aren't, and that makes for ineffective and self-defeating marketing. So what I'm saying is, marketing is completely oriented to the the market itself. Well, if you think about it, a blogger or a book publisher is somebody who aggregates a market. In other words, I aggregated a market around my blog. And what do I mean by that? I mean that my writing and the activities I was doing caused a lot of people who were interested in that subject to come and become kind of a loose-knit and once-in-a-while community around what I was doing. And that's what I mean by aggregating. So now I had a market, and the market was completely defined by people who were interested in what I was doing. <laughs> you know, writing about books, type fonts, page layouts, whatever. You fill in the blank on the content. So now I can market, I can get market information from my market that I've aggregated because they're all kind of sitting in front of me. I can, so they could tell me what their problem is or their situation or what their need is. But I can also ask them questions. I can interact with them. And so that is the essence of marketing to me. It's a conversation you have about a topic that you're very interested in and that interest is shared by the people you're talking to. So if you have mixed genres that are really wildly different, you kind of have to talk to them separately. Bad news, I'm afraid. <laughs> Pick one. That would be my advice. Don't try to do two things at once. It really almost never works out to your advantage. Pick one and tell yourself, wow, as soon as I really get over the hump on this one, then I will do the other one. So here's a good question from Diane Harwood. Can you talk a bit about ARCs, which I imagine are advanced review copies, and how to use one's blog to gauge interest for those who want advanced review copies? I'm super embarrassed to admit this, but I'm unclear how to create a mailing list with my blog. Yeah, well, there's no embarrassment needed, uh, really. It's, I was completely mystified myself. I didn't know how it worked. I mean, I could see other people doing it, but, you know, that's from the front. What was going on on the back end, I had no clue. Uh, so, um, but what was the first part of her question? Can you talk a bit about advanced review copies and ah, how right. to use right. blog to gauge interest? All right, so that's two completely separate questions. One's about growing an email list, and the other one's about ARC. So let's talk about ARCs. ARCs, A-R-C, that stands for either advanced review copy or advanced reader copy. That's mm -hmm. a distinction without much of a difference, but they are a little bit different, and obviously we use them, we use ARCs for a variety of reasons. We use them uh, for early reviewers, that is, people who are reviewing your book before it's published. And there are a number of, some of the biggest reviewers in the country, like the New York Times or Library Journal or Publishers Weekly, they won't review books that are already on the market. They only review them before they're published, hence the need for an advanced review copy, because that's the only kind of copy you're going to have. And the copies, by the way, as an aside, that you use for that purpose, should not have a barcode on the back. It's better if they don't, if you can arrange that. Because the barcode is only for retail use, so that kind of indicates that's a book intended for sale. So we have to mark the books. It should say on it, advanced review copy or advanced reader copy, not for sale. And uh, if you can get rid of the barcode, that's good. And then you want to have some marketing information, how you plan to market that book on the back cover. And then we use those for uh, getting testimonials, like, for instance, if I want to write to uh, 10 subject matter experts uh, or maybe type designers, I want them to look at my book on type, see if they would blurb it for me or give me a testimonial. That's a handy way to send them the book is the advanced review copy. And we also use them, like I said, for reviewers. Um, it can also be used for promotional reasons, but that's basically what we use advanced review copies for. find somebody else. So the other question, you're not really sure how to build an email list. I totally get that. I mean, I think if you are a nonfiction author who's a subject matter expert like I am, then a blog is a great way to build an email list because all your visitors, you can offer them 
something of value in exchange for their email list and an opportunity to talk to them further about the subject you're both interested in. Uh, that's how mostly how I built my email list, although I've learned a lot of other things. Now, if you're a fiction author, I suggest you go over and check out Nick Stevenson's training course called Find Your First 10,000 Readers. You know, just the title kind of is exciting, isn't it? Find your first 10,000 readers. It's something kind of, wow, yeah, that's what I want to do. And uh, it is a great course, by the way. I sell it, and uh, it's, it, re it is really about finding your first 10,000 readers and putting them on an email list. So, uh, All right, another question. This is from Christina Gerber. Hey, folks, do you post links to your blog in all social media formats? Facebook is done separately, I understand. You're a friendly coffee drinker. Well, I'm glad we have some coffee drinkers here. I have one decaf a day in the morning. That's what I'm down to. I spend a long lifetime as an avid coffee drinker. But you get older, stuff happens. That's what happens. All right, so <clears throat> links. Is that what we're talking about, getting links? Yeah, getting links to your blog. Do you put them on all social media formats? Yeah, now links on social media have a different purpose of course, because social media is media. We're talking about media sites, like a blog is a media site because we keep putting out new stuff. A newspaper is media because it's a new thing every day. They get news, you know, it's like, but if, if you think about it in terms of social media, if I put an ad in the paper and that it's now yesterday's paper, that's, so it's, it's over, right? It's finished. We only have one day exposure. On social media on Twitter, your tweet might have 15 minutes exposure. So what I see, what I use social media for mostly is driving traffic. In other words, I want, uh, I'm not going to try and write a long article on Facebook. I'm not going to write a 500 word status update. This is me personally. I'm just telling you what I do. Um, I do think a lot of authors should be on Facebook and that's a whole can of worms that we can't get into right now. I like Twitter. I'm a big Twitter user. Uh, but I use it for driving traffic. So if you look at Twitter and you see a headline that really catches your attention and a link, that's my basic tweet. You know, uh, why isn't your book selling more? Three reasons uh, to make it better with a link. Okay, I know a lot of authors are going to click that link because everybody thinks their book isn't selling well enough. It's not an author in the world that thinks their book is uh, couldn't sell more. So. Uh, that results in a visit to my site. That's traffic, okay? So that's not quite the same thing, but yes. Uh, I put a headline and a link or a status update on uh, Twitter. I do them on Pinterest. I do them on Facebook. I do them on Google+. Uh, and uh, I'm now doing a lot of Instagramming. I, that's kind of fun. I'm doing that more, for, not for the links, but more for engagement. And, uh, yeah, I think you should find a social media site that you really like where other people who are interested in what you're interested in are also there, and just do that one. Spend a few months just doing that site. Just get used to it, ins and outs, how people behave. <clears throat> There's always stuff going on on these social media sites. They're changing. You've got to learn the jargon. You've got to learn the best practices, what offends people. You know, I can always tell when somebody's new on Twitter because I get that direct message from them. You know, when you follow them, they send you that direct message. Hey, I'm an author. Come and check out my book. It's free today. Yeah, you don't want to send those direct messages. It's really kind of rinky. So if you just spent six months on one social media site, I bet you'd be a pretty brawny user by the end of that time. Then you can go to number two. But, you know, you've got to give yourself time. Don't think you're going to do all this stuff in a week. All right. Do you want to take a quick question or shall we go to the one slide? One more. One okay. more. Last question. Hopefully about blogging if you got one. I don't, but I have one that says, okay. do you recommend indie sell their e-books and print books on their sites or should indies just concentrate on writing and publishing and leave the sales to big retailers? <laughs> That's a great question, and it's a question yes. I'm asked pretty often. And, um, you know, the problem is, 
what kind of traffic do you have? Do you think you have more traffic or Amazon? Okay, that's not a serious question. So if you have no traffic, why would you bother doing it? It's a lot of work and it's a pain in the neck, to be honest with you, unless you have it. To do it without having to do any work, you'd need an integration with a shopping cart and you'd need a connection, an automated connection to a fulfillment house where they kept your print books and when every time an order came in they fulfilled your print book, obviously they're going to charge you for that privilege. So it's kind of a complicated thing to set up, but here's the real reason you shouldn't sell books from your website. And I'm talking print books specifically. And I, would, I wouldn't sell ebooks either, I, would, I only sell PDFs on my site. Uh, what happens when the person gets the book and the corner is banged and they decide they don't want that book? They want a book without a corner that's banged. They're going to send it back to you, aren't they? You want, you want to deal with that? Is that part of your writing life, dealing with customer complaints, missed shipments, shipments that never got there, people who got the item and want a refund because they think it's junk? No. Who wants to do that? I don't want to do that. And, and no writer in their right mind that I know of wants to do that. So uh, there are situations where it makes sense. Most of the time it doesn't, A, because you don't have any traffic, so you're not going to sell any anyway, and B, because it's so much hassle, it's really not worth your time and trouble. So I would leave it to retailers. There are situations where if you have something really unique that can only be put, bought from you, and I, I actually know publishers who pulled their books out of distribution and put them only on their website, but you've got to realize they did that after they were very well known in their field. And they had a lot of books. And they just decided, well, I'm not going to give up 55% anymore. I'm going to keep it all for myself. But they had a way of reaching the market that they uh, were writing for. If you don't have a way to do that, I would say it's a bad idea. All right, that's the last question. It's 201. I'm going to have to say goodbye. But before I say goodbye, I'm just going to throw up this Uh, can you see? I'm still here. Can you see it? All I see is my smiling self. Oh. Now, if people want to know how to get in touch with me, it's yeah. frequently a final question. And it is thebookdesigner.com. You could find me at thebookdesigner.com, and you could find all my other stuff emanating out from there. I don't know if I would need to shut my webcam off, Francis, but I don't uh, see your slide. Ah, there it is. There it is? Okay. So if you're interested in the social media toolkit or other toolkits that he has, it's authortoolkits.com forward slash social media for the social media toolkit. And I just want to thank you, Joel, so much for being on Conversations with Francis. It's been a total joy to talk to you and see you. And it's been a well, total joy to have everybody else here, too. Wait, Joel, did I cut you off? I cut you off. No, no, it's a pleasure, and I, I really appreciate your inviting me, Francis. I love talking about blogging, and I'm happy to do it any time. Ah, thank you. And thank you, everyone else who's been here today. This wouldn't be possible without you and your questions and your participation. So if you want 25% off the toolkits, including the social media toolkit, go to this website. And other than that, you will be receiving a replay link of this conversation in a few days. And until then, I think we'll come back in January with our next guest. So thank you so much for joining us today.